And today's topic is pottery and purpose. And, uh, you know, growing up, I grew up in Richmond, okay, which is right beside Waco, and so my, um, my or Irvin, most of y'all are familiar with Irvin, but uh, my family, I have family members that live in Waco, and Waco was right net, or is right where a very famous pottery place is. Anybody know what that pottery place was? Bybee Pottery, okay, and, uh, and unfortunately, they don't exist anymore. They've shut down since then, but I can remember as a kid going in there for our field trips at school. And getting to actually walk through this old building and see how they made the pottery. And they took you through all the rooms and you got to see it. It was just, it was really antiquated. It just seemed like this, like, like they were back in time when you'd go in there. But it was really neat to see how they would make these things work. And so this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about purpose and what our purpose is on this planet. And why do things happen the way they happen, and, and why do they happen that way, and, and is there a purpose behind that, etc. And, and so hopefully we're going to be able to answer some questions you may have this morning uh, about your own life. And so if you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're looking at verses 1 through 10. And if you would, kind of follow along with me there. Uh, I believe it'll be up on the screen. Um, but here we go. Let's see. Let me make sure I'm there, too. That would help. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, and this is a really powerful chapter, um, Treasures and Jars of Clay, and it says this, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The God of this age meaning Satan, okay? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Verse 5, For we do not preach ourselves but Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Let's pray. Father, we ask for now as we get into your word, that you would have your way, that you'd speak to our hearts and minds, those that are here, those that are watching online. God, we ask that you would just move, that you would open our eyes up to see your word for what it truly is, that God, I would be able to move out of the way, and that you would speak this morning, that you would be glorified. And that lives will be changed. All these things we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You know, we live in a world and in a country where purpose is paramount. We, it's, it's amazing to me, those who claim to not believe in God or believe in anything after this life, that we are still, as a culture, so driven to find purpose, to find meaning in the things that happen. And, uh, and I think that's important that we understand that this morning, that we determine our success oftentimes by our purpose. We determine our, our value, our worth, our feelings, all by our purpose and whether or not they're important. And, and this is a little psychological thing here this morning. So you need to understand we as creatures, we as people, are expressive by nature. Okay? And I want to explain what I mean by that. We, we as, it's natural that we are expressive. You're expressive in your type of music you listen to. Right? Everybody has their own different types of music. I, I like a lot of different types of music. I'm not a big headbanger. Okay? It's not my style. I, I, I'm not a raw, raw, raw kind of guy, but some people are. Okay? More power to them. I, I don't prefer to listen to bluegrass. I don't mind it. I like it, but I don't prefer to listen to it. Right? It just depends on the day. But we all have our own expressions. It might be art. You know, Picasso is a completely different type of painter than other painters. His stuff is all jacked up and moved around. It doesn't look like something you might not like, but other people love it. You know? We think about it. You go to a museum, and people stare at a painting. And that painting's worth a million dollars. Why? Because people valued that expression that that person had. We are naturally doing it. So think about your athletics. Singing is one way we express ourselves. Our job is a way we express ourselves. Architecture, fashion, 
That was it's funny. Lee and I were talking about this today because she showed me a picture from when we were younger, and I was wearing pleated pants. You know, and she hates pleated pants. Okay, um, and she was like, "Oh my goodness, you're wearing pleated pants." I was like, "Honey, I didn't know." I was like, "I don't know anything about fashion. Still don't really." And uh, and uh, you know, so that from poetry, literature, language. Some people like to express themselves by food, right? You have certain types of food, and cooks like to present it a certain way. Some people express themselves in violence. Some people express themselves with national pride. They're patriotic. Some people express themselves with a group identity. They, they find people who are similar-minded to them, and that's where they express themselves. This is who I am. And then all, all, the rest of us, uh, you know, we'll maybe we express ourselves on social media, which that's fun. All right. Okay. We're expressive creatures by nature. But what's more important about that is not only are we expressive, but we expect or we desire that those expressions have purpose. And here's what I mean by that. When you express yourself, you may be looking for approval. You may be looking for fame. You may be trying to express a message that people understand and get. You may be trying for recognition that people at least see what you're doing and are like, wow, I see you, I hear you, that's, that's impressive. You may be looking for impact that what you're doing changes the course of things. Maybe your expression, you want money for it. That's typically what we do with our jobs, right? We work to get paid, okay? And we, exp- we expect a wage, you know, we, we, we earn our wages. Maybe you want to instigate change. Or maybe you want, uh, let's see if I can pronounce this right, reciprocity, okay? That's a good word, okay? In other words, you want it to be reciprocated. So, for example, you express yourself in a relationship, right? Okay? First time that uh, Lee and I were dating, and it's the first time I kissed her. And I told this story before. She said, are you sure this is what you want? And I was like, I'll press her. Okay? So I just kissed her, and I was like, what do you think? And she said, I didn't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go back to the drawing board. Okay? Okay? That expression was not reciprocated in that moment. Okay? And, uh, and so we expect that these things will have purpose and that they will matter. And so it's, it's kind of this intertwined thing that we are expressive, but we want that, those expressions to have meaning in some sense to somebody. And, to, and, and so we need to keep that in mind as we do this, because if we understand that our lives should matter, it's, we, we understand that people matter and the things we do have impact and they matter. Because of that, we need to recognize also that unfortunately, oftentimes we misplace what gives us meaning. Because we are driven by our expressions, we're driven by this desire for it to matter, but a lot of times we misplace where we find that importance, where we find that meaning. For example, some of us find our meaning in our job. We're workaholics. We think that our job is the end all, that the world couldn't keep turning if we don't do our job. Some of us find it in our homes. We find it in our families. We find it in making sure that we change how our home looks or we, we make sure that everything's so clean that you know, it doesn't look like anybody lives there. Some of us find it in our relationships, our friendships, our, our dating relationships, our, our, our marriages, or whatever else. We're looking for our purpose and our meaning from somebody else, which is close to right, but you're looking to the wrong person. You find that meaning in Jesus, not in another man, not in another woman. You find it in Christ. Some of us look to our hobbies, the things we love to do, and that's where we find purpose. Others define it by your successes or failures. Others define it by money. Others define it by likes and followers and who responds to you online. We misplace all of this when those things are not where we're going to find our purpose. You know what those things are going to do? They're going to set you up for failure. They're going to fall out from underneath you. And when you try to find your purpose in those things and those things fail you, then you feel like a failure. Then I can't do anything right because the thing that was giving me meaning no longer gives me meaning. These are false foundations. And false foundations cause our world to crumble. For example, jobs are lost. You can lose a job, change a job. How many in the last 10 years have changed professions or changed locations? Okay, right? Uh, whether you've retired or you've changed where you're working or you changed who you're working for or changed what you're doing. Homes can be destroyed. Okay? Anybody in here ever had their home destroyed or lost something, something damaged their home? I know Sammy's raising his hand back there. His home was literally picked up by a tornado and sat back down. Okay? Relationships can end. And I tell my kids at school this, and I'm kind of a downer when it comes to this, because they're like, oh, so-and-so broke up with me, or so-and-so. I'm like, guys, you realize that every relationship you're ever going to be in except your marriage, if it lasts, will end and break up. Dun-dun-dun. 
That's the truth, right? Every relationship we'll ever have, unless we stay married, will end in a breakup. Every one. And that's why I'm very careful about encouraging kids in school to not date. Because what we do in school, our dating nowadays, and we talked about this last year, is that it's training you for divorce. When it doesn't work, stop it and go to somebody else. When it doesn't work, stop and go to somebody else. And that we, we take that into our marriages. And when it doesn't work, you know what? It's not working for me. It's not really what I wanted. So we just need to move on. And that's not biblical. That's not biblical because God doesn't do that with us. Numbers are deceiving. Maybe you get your success by what you're doing at work. Numbers do this, right? Hobbies can be temporary. You know, I love basketball. I can't play it anymore. I went and played volleyball with them last week, and I didn't think I was going to walk after it was over, okay? Successes and failures are inevitable. Inevitable. I want you to hear that. Successes and failures are inevitable, okay? And we will fail a whole lot more than we'll succeed. A whole lot more. Money, if that's where you're finding your worth, money causes more problems than good. More money, more problems. So this morning, let's look at Paul's letter, and let's see what he can tell us about our purpose and about why he mentions us as jars of clay, okay? And so this first point this morning is that we are fragile. We are fragile individuals. Uh, He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay, And see, this treasure he's talking about is this power of God, this light of God, the glory of God that is resting inside of us through the Holy Spirit. We are holding this in jars of clay. And so he mentions us as individuals. We are the jars of clay. Why? See, clay pots are useful. They're useful, and they can serve a purpose. But they're not extremely strong. They can easily be broken. You know, if any of y'all has pottery, you know that. It can chip, it can break, you have to be careful with it. You can't just like set it down on the, like you could a plastic cup, you have to be careful because it can break, but it can be very useful. But it's interesting that with pottery, its strength comes when it's fired, when it is put through a kiln, and after it's put through a kiln, it's glazed, and then it's fired again, okay? And this is what creates the strength of it. This is what allows it to uh, hold water or to do whatever else you're wanting it to do. But it's a question this morning that if we're made in God's image, which tells us in Scripture, if we're made in His image and we're carrying such a precious, most valuable thing on this planet inside of us, then how come we're put in this disposition and this, this natural cause of things where we are susceptible to so many struggles, so many pains, so many hurts? Why is this the case? Why would He make us like this if He was wanting to reside in us? Well, it's important to understand what God is wanting to do. He's wanting to glorify himself, not us. And this is important this morning. It's amazing that we carry, as believers, if you're not a believer this morning, we are talking about two different things. As believers, we carry the light of Christ inside of us when we very well shouldn't. We should not be able to, and yet he does. And it says it's the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ that lives inside of us. So this morning, first things first, first, things first we have to stop pretending that we are not fragile. Okay? It's, it's interesting that um, we oftentimes think that the good should be the norm. And that's why we get upset when tragedies happen or when disasters happen or when someone loses somebody. Guys, tragedy is the norm for us as people. It is the norm. We are sinners in a broken, fallen world, and we are just getting worse and worse and worse as people. Why? Because that's our natural order. We are selfish, self-centered, self-serving. And so tragedy is the norm when you have a group of people who are self-serving and selfish. It's the norm. And I don't mean tragedy as in terrible things happen, but everything is going to be moving towards the bad because of our sin. And so when we get to the point where we realize, okay, this is who we really are. Scripture tells us we are sinners separated from God. There's no one good, no not one, no one righteous. Then we start to look at ourselves a little differently. Like, okay, the question we want to ask is why do bad things happen to good people? But the question we should be asking is why do good things happen to me at all? Because I don't deserve anything God gives me. It's all a gift. And so we begin to recognize, hey, maybe I really am a clay pot. Maybe I really can break in an instant. Maybe I really am not worthy to hold what he's given me. And that's where we got to start. Because when we can start recognizing that our life is not our own, that we are bought with a price and we recognize that we don't deserve this, then we can carry it. Because otherwise, we're going to think we're worthy of carrying it. Yeah, God should let me be his ring bearer. He should let me be the one that's doing this for him. No, he shouldn't. 
We didn't do anything to deserve it. Matter of fact, we did the opposite. We lost that trust in him the day that we, took, that we decided to disobey him. See, the clay pots also remind us of our position before God and in comparison to God, that we are nothing like him. We are of no value besides what he puts into us. We are ordinary, and we are on equal playing field with everyone else apart from Jesus Christ. He says, consider no one better than yourselves, but serve others. We are on the same playing field. We are all clay pots. But what's beautiful about this is God wants to use ordinary men and women to serve his purpose. That's awesome. That's an awesome thing. And you know what was interesting about the Bobby pottery is that they really weren't so much different than other pieces of pottery. But you know what made them valuable? So when you turned them over, and on the bottom, there was a B, B that was carved into them. It was the name that was on the pottery that made it valuable. And I hope you see the spiritual significance of that this morning. That he is, his, he is putting his name on us, he's identifying us as him, as his, when we become believers. And therein lies our value. Our value comes from Christ. So this morning, may we be keenly aware of the fragility of our souls. May we recognize how quickly and how easily we can be broken. The second thing, not only are we fragile, but we are tested. Okay? And I want, you, I want to unpack this verse for just a minute, starting with verse 7. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Check that out. The reason why he makes us like this, the reason why we are in this broken state, the reason why we struggle and we don't have it all figured out is so that he can be glorified. Because the reason we are able to endure, the reason we are able to grow, the reason we are able to change things is because of him and not from us. And so here's what he says here in, in, in verse 7, or verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side. The next verse he says, or the next part he says, we are perplexed. Then he says, we're persecuted. Then he says, we're struck down. And now, I don't know about you all, but someone comes up to you and you're like, hey, I've got this new club, this new group, and I really want you to join. And if you join it, we're going to be like, everybody's going to be pushing in on us and crushing us, and they're, they're, we're really not going to understand anything that's going on, and we're going to be persecuted, and then we're going to be struck down. You want to join? Right. I'm, I'm, no thanks. No thank you. That sounds awful. But this is the guarantee of being a follower of Jesus Christ. The guarantee. Not if, but when. But look at what he says here. This is what's awesome about it. See, the amazing thing that happens is when Christ is in our lives, we become a target. We become a target, and I think we don't look, we don't look at it that way oftentimes because we feel like, well, this is just how things are. Satan hates you. He hates you, and he's going to do everything he can if God is working in your life to tear you down. You become a target for him, and we need to recognize that this morning. But the, the reality is that Christ inside of us, allows us to be resilient so when people try to crush us from every side so if you were to take a pot okay a clay pot and push it from both sides with enough pressure it's going to very quickly break very quickly but what if you push and push and you hit and you hit and it didn't break you'd think something was strange about that pot wouldn't you well that's how we are because the world is pushing in on us it's trying to crush us and yet we don't crush why is that because what's inside of us is pushing back harder than what the world is pushing in he says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. And then he says, we are perplexed, but we're not in despair, which is a really interesting idea. And he says, we are persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. See, the reference of jars of clay is important because these pots must be fired at such a high enough temperature that to mature the clay. Right? The clay's not just ready to do this at, at a moment's notice. It's actually got some other stuff that's been put into it. And when it's fired, it allows that to take shape and be strong enough to hold that shape. And then the glaze you put on there, and this is what I was reading yesterday, the glaze, once it's heated at an even higher temperature, it actually changes the composition of the clay to where it can hold water. And this is really interesting because this is exactly what Jesus does in us. It's not only does he change us and fire us and test us, but he also changes who we actually are from what we used to be. And that's an awesome thing. Many of the things that hurt or take our attention in this life or cause us to be distracted are also things that are part of our firing process. It's part of the process that God is using to make us into who he wants us to be. For example, in Scripture, in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, he says, In this you greatly rejoice. 
Though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now listen to this. These, these trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Did you catch that? That this grief, these struggles that we have are doing something in us. They are changing who we are to where when Christ comes back, we're who we're supposed to be. And that's a hard thing to swallow in the moment because we look at the things going on. We're like, why, God? Why is this happening? Why is this going on? Because we don't see the end process. Matter of fact, we don't even know what we're supposed to be. We don't know what shape we're supposed to take. But in Isaiah 48, 10, God is speaking and he's talking to the prophet and he says, See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Interesting that he uses the furnace of affliction, that it's the problems and the pain that is what fires us to be the shape we're supposed to take. And yet most of us, we want to avoid those things. We want to avoid those pains. But what we're really doing by avoiding them is we're avoiding becoming who God wants us to be. And yet we think that's the best way. Because what do we live in? We live in a society that says, you know, do your thing. Let, let, just make it easy. Whatever's easiest, whatever's comfortable, whatever makes you happy, do that. And God's saying, no, do what I ask you to do. That's completely countercultural. And then it says in James 1, 2, and 3, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. See, in our lives, we have all kinds of things that are performing a work on us. These griefs that we're talking about. It could be loneliness. It could be loss. It could be frustration. Patience, like you're waiting for something to happen and it's just not happening as fast as you want it to happen. It could be anger. It could be hurt. It could be confusion. All these things are performing a work. But those four things that he mentions in this, in this chapter were hard-pressed. Every one of us is hard-pressed at some point in time, whether it's stress, finances, responsibilities, uh, relationship struggles, all of these things, people's opinions, all these things are pressing in on us to try to conform us to something else. And yet Christ says, in me, with the power that I will put inside of you, I will hold you still. You won't crush, even though they're pressing in. When it says we're perplexed, but we don't despair. You know, there's, have you ever been in a moment where you're like, I don't understand why this is going on right now? Right? With somebody who doesn't know Christ, who doesn't know that there is an author and perfecter of faith, who doesn't know that there's somebody who's in control in all of this, it's easy to look around us and be like, woe is me. I don't know what to do. I can't handle this. I can't do anything with this. But to the Christian, we should be able to look around it, even when we don't understand. We should never despair, ever, because Christ himself says, Surely I will be with you always until the very end of the age. That we don't have to despair even when we don't understand, but we can walk confidently with God. And there's times, like I said, these, these were perplexed. Why don't, I have, why don't I have children? Why am I not married? Why did I lose my job? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? We have all these questions, and God's like, Just, I've got you. I've got you. Just keep walking. We're persecuted. And I think this is a, a word that we've, we toss around too flippantly in America. Persecuted because we can't put the Ten Commandments up. No, you're not. You're not personally persecuted because you can't put the Ten Commandments up. Now, when somebody threatens to end your life because you believe in the Ten Commandments, then you're being persecuted. Let's, let's get, get out of this namby-pamby, you know, wussy Christianity that, oh, don't, don't speak badly about Jesus. How about we just stand up and love people like Jesus? Know your Bible so you can respond to them instead of saying, don't talk like that to me. But rather say, you know what? I hear you. But let me tell you what Jesus says. And do it in a way that is effective as opposed to, oh, we're going to get in an argument about this. We too often allow other people to dictate how we respond. But when we are persecuted, and it tells us that it's coming. It tells us in Scripture that you will be persecuted for my name's sake. It will happen. When it does... We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. You may lose friendships. People may say terrible things about you. They may defame you. But it says in all this that you are not abandoned, that Christ has not gone anywhere, that he is there with you through it all. But we will be persecuted if we were obedient to his call. And then we're struck down. 
And see, circumstances and a combination of, of these other three being hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, all these things can knock us down. But what's interesting, and I love this, this makes me think of Rocky, which, you know, I, I love Rocky movies, all 27 of them, however many, until he dies, okay? Uh, but Rocky IV is most people's favorite Rocky when he fights Ivan Drago. Okay? He fights the Russian, uh, which, by the way, there's a Creed movie coming out where, anyway, um, yeah, moving on. But he fights the Russian. And one of my favorite scenes in the movie is that this guy keeps hitting him, hitting him, and he's just pulverizing him. And he just lays him out. Bam! And Rocky gets back up slowly. And now Rocky's starting to get mad and, and excited. Of course, the music's pumping. And he hits him again. And as he hits the mat, he pops right back up. And the Russian's just like, who is this guy? You know, guys, we're getting struck down every single day by Satan. He's coming at us every single day. And people are watching us to see how we respond. And it wouldn't it be an amazing thing that even when you get hit with the worst news that you could possibly get and you feel like you're not going to be able to get back up, that you get back up? And you might not have all the strength you had before, but you're like, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. And the worst Rocky movie ever is my favorite. It's Rocky V. It's Rocky V when he fights the guy in the street. Okay? If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Your life will be blessed, I promise. Okay? <laughs> Don't want to miss a blessing, right, Dieter? Okay? And so there's a, my favorite part in this movie is at the very end when Rocky fights Tommy Gunn. And in the, they're out in the street, and Tommy Gunn just literally beats him up, knocks him down. And you see he has this like moment where he's laying on the ground, and he sees everybody, and, and everybody loves. And he gets back up, and he's like, hey, yo, Tommy. And he turns around, and he looks around, and he goes, I didn't hear no bell. And they go back at it, right? And he wins. But it's because he never quit. And that's the one thing that people were, that's why Rocky was such a popular movie for people is because they saw themselves in the underdog. They saw themselves in the person who shouldn't quite make it, and yet he does. We see that in ourselves, but we have this question, can I really do it? Can I really get back up? And Jesus Christ says, yes, you can, because I'll get you up. That's hope. That's hope in a world that's trying to change us and conform us. We not only endure the test through the power of God, which it says in verse 7, but it's also how we are made and why we are made. And this brings us to our last point. We have a perfect purpose. A perfect purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. He's speaking directly to the, Jer the prophet Jeremiah in this passage, but God doesn't make anything by mistake. And it tells us in Psalms that he created us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. He knew us in our mother's womb before we were born. God has a plan for your life. It says in, second, or in Ephesians chapter 2, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has made you for a reason. But the problem is we tend to go astray from God's will for our lives. We're a lot like little children. Okay? Right now, Canon, Canon loves a water bottle like a, a, a baby bottle with water in it. He loves it, but he can't figure out how to lift it up. He can't figure out how to lift it up to get the water, so he just uh, uh, chews on it, thinking he can get it out of there, right? But if you take it from him and try to give it to him himself, what does he do? He starts to take it out of your hand. Give it, I want it, right? Don't we do that to God so often? God's trying to guide us. He's trying to show us, and we're like, I can do it. I can do it, right? We do it all the time, just like little kids, when he's trying to, to look out for us, we try to create our own purpose. But we have to realize our purpose is far greater than our passions, our professions, our families. A lot of times we think, well, my purpose is to be a mom. My purpose is to be a dad. My purpose is to do this job. My purpose is to be a, pre a preacher. No. Those are vehicles for your purpose. Because our purpose is to seek and save the lost, to glorify God with how we live our lives. And so that's where it has to start and then all of our interaction from there is how we live out our purpose. As a teacher, teaching's not my purpose. People are my purpose. Loving others, serving others, that's my purpose because people are the most important and valuable thing on this planet. And yet we treat them like junk. It's crazy how we've flipped this around. Whether you're a teacher this morning, a banker, photographer, stay-at-home mom, you're in the military, you do real estate, you're a parent, you're a student, you're an athlete, you're a business owner, whatever it may be, okay, 
Your purpose is bigger than those things. Think about it like this, okay? Like it's a cup of coffee. What we typically do in our lives is we think, okay, if my purpose is this cup of coffee, I'm going to fill it with all the things I care deeply about, and there's my purpose. I'm going to love my kids. That's my purpose is to be a great parent. No, that's, that's your responsibility. That's not your purpose. But we try to fill it in with all these things, and we're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make sure I add Jesus in this so he mixes in with all of it. No, Jesus don't mix. It's not, that's not the way. We dump out that cup, and we say, Jesus, fill my cup. You be my entire purpose. Because that's, that's where it's found. It's found in him, not in anything the world has to offer. But here's where it changes, is that he has made each one of us to walk a certain walk, each one of us to take a certain journey. And so what that does is my passions, my talents, my, the things I care deeply about, those flavor my coffee. But they are not my coffee. And that's why my cup is different than Eric's cup. And Eric's cup is different than Barb's cup. And Barb's cup is different than Tori's cup. Because God has put us to do certain things Good works that he's prepared beforehand for us to do. Put us in certain people's paths that somebody else is not going to be in their path. So my purpose is the same as Eric's purpose. But we live it out a different way. Because that way we can cover more ground. We can seek and save more people. Because each one of us has a different vehicle to achieve our purpose. But so often we want to mold our clay ourselves. You know, in Romans chapter 9, Scripture tells us this. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common uses? And, and, and in this passage, he's talking a lot about predestination and, and being chosen versus not being chosen. That's for another sermon. But I think a lot of us, we look at other people and we determine whether or not we're being successful or whether or not we're serving God appropriately based on how they are or what they have. We see they have this and I don't have this, so I must be lacking but it tells us here that God makes us for a reason. And I think sometimes we're like, well, I'm not, I'm not a noble purpose. I'm a common purpose. Let me tell you something. There are way more common things in my house than there are noble things. Way more common things. Right? I don't need gold forks to eat. Right? Besides these two things right here, I just need a plastic fork. Right? And that serves the purpose I need. Right? We had this idea that nobler or more expensive or this, that, and the other is better. That's fine if that's your, if that's your prerogative, if that's what you like. But it doesn't function any differently than this. We went to the Biltmore when Lee and I were first married. And Charles Vanderbilt, the guy who built the Biltmore, uh, anyway, um, in his room, his room had gold-laced wallpaper. Didn't it? Like the wallpaper itself was lined with gold. All the way around the room, and I'm like, I hate wallpaper. You know, even if it is gold. Like, but this is what he thought was valuable. that made him look good, and this is what did, more power to him. It didn't serve any better purpose than somebody's wallpaper they bought at Walmart. It didn't serve any better purpose. Okay? And so when we recognize that God has made us for a reason and made me individually for a reason and you individually for a reason, if we were to find our purpose in that, we'd be much better served as a community, as a group of believers, to do what he's had us to do. But like I said, we often think our purpose should be a certain thing. And typically, it's something that's easy for us. It's something that requires very little work. And it's something that might be our passion or, or, or something to that effect. We're like, okay, this is easy. I'll do this. And so for me, I'm, I'm finding this out as we go. Like, speaking to you all is easy for me. I love to talk. Okay? No problem there. No problem. But it's the behind-the-scenes stuff that's difficult for me and where God is really molding me and changing me on how to interact and, and try to lead. That's where I struggle, but that's where he's taking me. So, like, this is the easy part for me. So this is not my purpose. This is not my purpose. This is part of my purpose is to teach you all about Jesus. But then he wants us to lead as well. And so we had to find out where does he actually want us to go, and that's been a hard thing for me. I told you all that when I had this moment with God a couple weeks ago that when he told me, X, you know, whatever it is that he told me, I was like, I can't do that. And what I really meant was I don't want to do that, right? Because that's going to be difficult, because that's going to be outside of my capabilities. And then that was when he was like, I know. That's why I'm telling you that, because you got to trust me. And so that's where we find ourselves. And so this morning, I want to give you a good example of what it should look like when we try to serve God ourselves, we try to create our own purpose, we try to 
fix things ourselves. We try to take and mold what God has planned for us, and we do it in a way that makes sense to us. So this morning, I'm going to try my hand at pottery. I've never done this before in my life, all right? And uh, we'll see how this works out. Um, this could be bad, but we shall see, okay? Do what? Okay. Yeah, we'll see how this works out if I can get, off, get my shirt off. Okay. But um, I'm very thankful for, for Haley, Stacy bringing this up here. But when, when I do this, again, I have no idea. I know how to turn it on. That's about it. And I guess this is what I'm supposed to be doing. All right, so here's my clay. This is my purpose in life, okay? That's what I'm working with. Oh, yeah, if I make a mess, I'll clean it up. Don't you worry. All right, so... I guess I got to put it in gear here. All right. All right, what's wrong here? What am I doing wrong, Haley? It's plugged in. It's turned on. The green light's on. Is this not hooked up? Maybe. No. Okay. Does it need a warm up? I don't know. Okay, this project might not be what I thought it was going to be. I feel like in just a second I'm about to get hit by this ball. <laughs> Check that plug in. There it was. Thank you, Sammy. Okay, so now I don't even know what to do, honestly. I mean, I know this pedal will turn this wheel... Um, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give me a little hole here. But I think uh, I really this is really, really weird and very frustrating um, that I don't know what to do with this. I'm making a mess. I know that. You know, so let's turn it up a little bit. Maybe if my wife gets busier, I can fix this. Okay. No, that's going to send it off the thing. All right, so good grief. As somebody who likes to do art, this is really going to make me upset this morning. So I'm going to have an altar call for me. All right, so what happens in our lives is that we try to shape this, and we're trying to mold this, and I really, this is frustrating. Um, so we're going to make a, no, we're not either. Um, so when we think about our lives, so we're trying to create this, and we get it at the right speed, and we get it in a tempo that we think is effective. But you know what? Maybe I just need to add a little bit more to it. Maybe, that, maybe that'll do it you know and don't don't we do this in our lives we try to we try to add something else you know if I just do this thing that'll make it better you know and and maybe if I just put a little more pressure on it this way that'll make it better no it won't um it's actually making it worse and so we keep doing this and and some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about you're trying to work with your life and see I mean it's just tearing stuff up okay <laughs> And, and we laugh, but we're, we're actually crying on the inside because you know exactly what I'm talking about in your own life, that you're trying your best to create something. And you're working hard, and you're, you're looking at it from as many angles as you can, but the reality is, is you don't have the skill set to do, even if you keep adding to your life, adding church, adding choir practice, adding, you know, adding a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, or a family or a child, like you're adding all this stuff, thinking, well, that, that, will, that will give me purpose, and that will shape my life, and I'll be who I'm supposed to be and at some point you realize you have no idea what you're doing and we have to take a moment and be like you know what God I, I, what I'm doing is not working clear, clearly I mean who wants to put this on their table okay. it has no purpose I mean it really can't be anything other than an awful paperweight and yet at some point in our lives we have to ask God can you do this for me? Can you shape this for me? Can you, can you make this what, I, what you want it to be? Because you know, in my head, I was like, I can make a bowl. Surely I can make a bowl. I can't make a bowl. Okay? But that was, my, that, was my mind's, that was my purpose. I was going to make a bowl, and that was what I was going to be. I was going to be a bowl, and I was going to hold these things, and this was who I was going to be. And I tried to add all this other stuff to try to, way, to fix it the way I thought I could fix it, but I can't fix it. And so at some point, I had to stop, and I have to give, I have to give up control. And I've got to let somebody, in this case the potter being Jesus, somebody take my clay and form it. And so right now, I'm going to invite Haley to come up here, okay, if she would. And uh, Haley's our, it's, it's funny, Haley was one of my former students. She's now the art teacher at the high school. 
and I'm going to let her, who has a degree in ceramics and pottery, take over, okay, on this. Because, again, I, have not, I, mean, I don't know what I'm doing, okay? And so as she works on this, somebody who knows what she's doing, I don't know what she's going to make. I have no idea. But I just want to keep talking to you all. So when we recognize that God has a purpose for us, see, I didn't even, there's tools. I didn't even know there was tools for that. <laughs> okay? God has a purpose for each one of us. He, he has a plan for each one of our lives if we let him form us. And it's interesting in Scripture, it says if we want to know this plan that God has, we have to know God. We have to know Jesus Christ. Okay? It says without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. And yet, as we are putting our faith in Jesus, it tells us in Romans, it says, Therefore, um, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so when I think about this, in that passage it says don't be conformed, but be transformed. So we have two types of forming going on, guys. And if you don't understand this morning that the world as a whole is going to conform you. The world is spinning. It's moving constantly, both literally and figuratively. And it's moving in such a way that change is going to take place. And if we don't get out of the way, the world is slowly but surely going to change you to what it wants you to be. And this morning, God is telling us that if we want to be who he called us to be, who he's asked us to be, we have to allow Jesus to take us out of the world and transform our mind. To literally change the thing we thought we were becoming or thought we were supposed to be and change it to where it's what he wants us to be. But how do we do that? We do that by putting our faith and trust in Jesus. And I want to say this this morning because we try to make this, this, this basic thing, but I think a lot of times we gloss over sin in our lives. Part of the firing process is to get rid of the impurities, to get rid of the holes to where water can be held. And right, what does Jesus do when we put, when we put our faith and trust in him? Living water begins to flow from inside of us. But it's because he is firing us in the process. To put our faith and trust in Jesus means to admit, God, I am broken, I am a sinner, and my sin, because of my sin, just one of my sins, I can't be with you. And God says, I know. That's why I sent my son. He took your sin from you. And if you were to put your faith in him, believe that he died on the cross for your sins, and that you believe that he rose from the grave on the third day, he says, you'll be saved. In other words, I will come and live in you. I will give you, it tells us in the Old Testament, that he will give us a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. He'll put a new spirit in us, and he'll make us into the very thing he wanted us to be from the beginning. But the problem is, a lot of times, that thing's not what we thought it was going to be. It's not what we imagined it to be. But when we get there, we recognize that I wouldn't want my life to be anything but this. Because God's plans are perfect. They are for our good and not to hurt us, but to give us hope and to give us a future. And what he's doing in our lives, he's shaping us, he's moving, he's molding, he's getting rid of things that we didn't think we necessarily needed to get rid of, and he's doing it in such a way that as we start to see it take shape, we're like, oh, oh, I think I know, I think I know. And so you begin to get excited because you're all of a sudden seeing things fall into place. That means it gets easier, it just means you're starting to see things take shape, and you're starting to see, okay, this was what I was supposed to be, but we can't do it apart from Jesus. Apart from Jesus, you have no idea what his plan is for you, and you can't know. And so this morning, I'm going to give an invitation for several things. Because it's not just about knowing Jesus. There's some of you in here who believe in Jesus. You put your trust in Jesus. But you've never followed through with certain commitments in your life. Maybe you're running from joining the church. Maybe you're, you're running from being baptized. Maybe you're running from accepting the call he has in your life. But when we allow him to do what he's going to do, that makes me sick. All right. <laughs> But you know what? I can't tell you many times that that's happened to me with God. That I'm like, this is what it's supposed to be, God. This is what we want to do. This is what we're going to do. And then he's like, no, you're not. And then he begins to shape it. And I begin to see it take form into something that I never could have made myself. Never could have imagined my life being like it is right now. And I can't imagine when it's going to be 10 years from now because God is continually making me. He's not done until I stand before him. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so this morning... I want to invite you. Maybe there's some of you here who you've, you've been trying to control your own life. You've been trying to pull the reins, and it's just not working. It's just not working. And you're finally, you're like, I can't do this anymore. I can't. What I'm doing is not working. God, will you take over? If that's you this morning, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to come down. 
I'm going to ask you to make a decision to walk down this aisle and stand at, sit at this altar and lay those things before God. Ask him to move in your life. Ask him to take control. Let him be the potter and you just be the clay. Because from the beginning, we've been trying to shape ourselves when we could have just given it over to him. There may be some of you in here who have some burdens in your life, some things that you've been struggling with, some insecurities, some doubts, whatever. You've been hard-pressed, you've been crushed, you feel like you've been persecuted, and you're just struggling. Lay it at his feet. Bring it to the potter. Because when we do, the potter has the tools, has the knowledge, has the experience, and the vision for what you're supposed to be. And so this morning, as they sing, as they play this last song, I'm going to invite you, if you have a decision to make this morning, as she continues to finish this up, won't you come down? Won't you make a decision for the Lord this morning? Won't you lay down your clay and let God make your purpose? Let him show you what you're meant to be. Let's bow our heads this morning as they sing this first verse. If you have a decision to make, won't you come down, please? Mm -hmm.